Uh, all right, everybody. Thanks for uh, for thanks for coming out. Uh, for you guys don't know me, I'm Matt Buckholz. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eric Gostinson uh, from the University of Delaware. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. He holds an affiliated appointment in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Uh, his research focuses on processing and characterization of composite materials, focusing on carbon nanotube and advanced fiber reinforcements for the development of novel multifunctional composites and micro nanomechanics modeling techniques. So without further ado, Dr. Fossens. Thank you. Um, so today I want to really uh, kind of give you a, a broad overview of some of the research that's going on in my group, uh, specifically in, in carbon nanotube based composites. So over about the past 15 years, I've been involved with the ongoing research programs focusing on processing, characterization, and bottling uh, of carbon nanotube based materials. And uh, I think, you know, at the very initial stage of the research, uh, it was very exploratory, uh, but right, right now we're starting to push the boundaries of what we can do with this now and, uh, and moving more into applications. So uh, I'll specifically highlight uh, some of our recent work over about the past five years in uh, utilizing carbon nanotubes uh, to sense cracks in composite materials, uh, to form conductive networks and, and form nerve-like conductive networks and sense cracks in situ. Uh, but a lot of this really uh, drew out of this fundamental processing and characterization work. Uh, so um, I would like to start with this slide because I think this really highlights this vast difference in the reinforcement scale uh, between a traditional fiber reinforcement, such as a carbon or a glass fiber, uh, and a carbon nanotube. Uh, of course, this is, these are just uh, some uh, electron micrographs of my own research. Of course, this is a woven fabric, and of course, the scale of that, a full-size part is centimeters or meters. Uh, you're looking at the woven fabric unit cell, and that's on the millimeter scale. And uh, this next picture is a single carbon fiber with about seven micron in diameter, uh, where there are carbon nanotubes that were grown directly onto the surface of the fiber. Uh, so this is some work that I did about uh, well over 10 years ago. And, uh, and you can see this really is just a three-order of magnitude difference in the scale of the reinforcement. And I think that uh, this is really both the key challenge uh, from an experiment and modeling point of view, but also the opportunity in that we can combine these reinforcement scales uh, to add some new functionality to composites. And these next uh, just show the, uh, the nanoscale, the morphology, and the wall structure of the carbon nanotube. Uh, so here, this is a multi-walled nanotube, uh, and the diameter of this is about 10 nanometers. So again, about three orders of magnitude smaller uh, than the carbon fiber. Uh, so I'll just give a, a kind of a brief over, overview motivation of what my group is looking at. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about these manufacturing approaches, particularly new approaches where we can hybridize materials. And one of those being where we can synthesize and grow nanotubes directly on the surface, uh, but also some more recent things uh, that we've been looking. And, and I'll end up focusing on this, uh, utilizing the carbon nanotube networks for uh, sensing of damage in situ, and some of our more recent work at not only being able to sense that there is damage, but able to uh, sense the location of that damage. Um, you know, and I think uh, carbon nanotubes, especially, they've, we've been first observed well over 20 years ago now, and I think what excited us from a composite's point of view is they have their combination of both excellent stiffness and strength. Um, and in addition, they have their nanoscale diameters, uh, so they have a high aspect ratio, uh, along with uh, very large uh, electrical and thermal conductivity. Um, but as we first started working in nanocomposites, uh, this is maybe around the year 2000, where I started working in carbon nanotube-based composites, the National Nanotechnology Initiative had just come out, and there was a lot of discussion about manufacturing at the nanoscale, and that we're gonna, going to make these materials from the bottom up, uh, build them from the atoms, molecules, nanoscale powders, um, but I thought, you know, and, and my own research, my background is in traditional fiber composites. Uh, so as a PhD student, I'd already been studying composites for uh, about six or seven years. And of course, I didn't see this as anything that was revolutionary. In fact, this is what scientists and composites have been doing for decades. We select the constituent materials, we tailor their interaction at the interface, which is certainly at the nanoscale. Uh, you know, we uh, bend and twist fibers, or we control the fiber orientation to control the properties. Uh, and of course, uh, they are really materials by design. 
that where you combine these distinct reinforcement scales or just the, the reinforcement phases together and control the orientation in order to get the properties. Uh, so this type of bottom-up manufacturing is really just extending it down uh, to another scale with carbon nanotubes. Uh, and of course there is a lot of physical phenomena that's very different at the nanoscale. Uh, so we often have to take into account atomic interactions and I've collaborated with a number of uh, uh, people who do modeling. Uh, but if you can look, there's up to the nanoscale, up to where we could combine these reinforcements together. Uh, so some of the manufacturing approaches we've been looking at is this direct hybridization where we take the nanotubes, we either grow the nanotubes on the fibers or we somehow directly incorporate them into their eye fibers uh, and then following uh, adding the resin. But uh, we've also, this direct hybridization, also a dispersion and infusion approach where we can take the nanotubes and we disperse them in the polymer uh, and then infuse them into the fiber uh, composite. And of course, I talked briefly about, I showed this micrograph, And of course, when we hybridize these materials, we could think of this um, as a reinforcement hierarchy. So we can, with the carbon nanotubes being that they're very small, uh, we can reinforce that small region around the fiber, uh, such as if we were to grow the carbon nanotube, we, uh, we would call that the interface or the interphase region. Uh, but of course, there can be, uh, the next step is this transverse reinforcement in a fiber bundle, all the way up to the scale of the woven fabric. Uh, so this approach where we grew the nanotubes on the fibers, uh, and there's uh, companies, there's a lot of groups that are doing this, and there are companies, in fact, one in the Baltimore area, uh, that is commercializing this approach. Um, and in this case, we essentially, we took fiber bundles and we added catalysts, and we placed them in tube furnace under the right conditions, uh, and reactant gases, uh, and, uh, and essentially, uh, the growth was about 660 degrees C, and the growth time was about a half hour. Um, but I didn't, as a student, I didn't really see this as being something that was going to be, even though the chemical vapor deposition process is a scalable process, I didn't see that we were going to be doing this at a large scale. Uh, and there is a lot of fundamental challenges uh, in, associated with this in terms of degrading the fibers, uh, and there's also temperature limitations. So if you're to deposit onto a, a carbon or a glass fiber, uh, there's some upper limit associated with temperature. But in this case, uh, we first looked at this, and we utilized this to look at the properties of the fiber matrix interface. And so we we're essentially creating a nanocomposite interface around the fiber. And this change, it's really this change in the reinforcement scale allows us to selectively stiffen uh, the interface around the fiber. So that increases the shear modulus of the uh, polymer matrix, which actually results in uh, better load transfer. Uh, but in my own work over the past few years, uh, what we've been looking at is a different approach to this direct hybridization, but uh, something that where we can actually control the process better. Because uh, with CVD, what you grow in the reactor, you might burn off or you might degrade the uh, reinforcement itself, but you're stuck with what you grow. So if you have to add chemical functionality uh, or something at a late, that's, that requires a separate step. Uh, so what we've been looking at is using electrophoresis uh, approach to essentially not only deposit and integrate, but graft, chemically graft the nanotubes to the fiber surface. And the electrophoresis approach is actually, uh, is something that's used, certainly is used industrially as a, is essentially a plating process, uh, and it's something that's readily scalable. So we create a, a dispersion of nanotubes in water, and we can create, we can control the purity of the nanotubes, the morphology, as well as the chemistry. Uh, and then we, functionalize it so we have a, a charge on the nanotube itself. It could be a positive or a negative charge, uh, and that gives it what we call the electrophoretic mobility. So in an electric field, opposites attract, right? So if we have a positively charged particle, those nanotubes, interesting, <laughs> they're supposed to deposit on the cathode. Now oh, there they are. Um, so in this case, is, you know, we're, we're creating a water-based dispersion. This is a process that's done at room temperature. Uh, we've coated a lot of different types of fibers, polymer fibers, polyester, Kevlar, 
uh, as well as glass fibers and also carbon fibers. So one of the key benefits is that we can control the nanotube purity and the chemical functionality and we can control it so that we will actually form a covalent bond with the surface of the fiber but also the polymer matrix. Um, we, we're not removing any of the existing fiber sizing. Uh, certainly that's an important thing, especially in glass. Uh, scale levels, ambient temperatures, and uh, this critical step is this functionalization step. And uh, what we've developed this process is a continuous process uh, called, uh, uh, we use uh, ultrasonic uh, ozone functionalization. And so this is uh, the as-received nanotubes. And the as-received, when we buy them, they're highly entangled. It's almost a spaghetti-like entanglement. Uh, so being, to separate, being able to separate these and utilize them, that's one of the key challenges with one of the key barriers to overcome. Uh, so you see these large agglomerates uh, of the nanotubes uh, in their as-received condition, but as we treat them and we functionalize it with polyethylene amine, uh, we've done a lot of different types of functionalization, uh, but you can see that there's a, we have a lot of agglomerates and we've really, we're really able to get rid of almost all of the agglomerates and any remaining agglomerates we can easily centrifuge out. And the functionality, as I mentioned, um, we've tried many different functionalities, but the, our focus right now is uh, polyethylene amine, or PEI. And probably a decade ago, there was a lot of interest in utilizing PEI to toughen epoxies, uh, as well as tailor the fiber matrix interface and composites. Uh, so that it's something that's been established, but we can also graft it. And what's nice about PEI is that if we can control the pH, the polyethylene amine protonates. So it gives it a very strong positive charge. Uh, so that the polyethylene amine uh, not only is a processing aid and that gives it a positive charge, but the PEI chemically bonds with the nanotube and also we can put chemical groups or uh, control it so that it chemically bonds with the fiber surface. And as I mentioned, we've done this on both carbon and glass fiber. And in carbon fiber, and we've done it on a fairly reasonable scale, and the carbon fiber, because it's conductive itself, it's the electrode. Uh, so that you know, essentially you can wire it up and, and there'll be a potential. Uh, so we, <laughs> excuse me, uh, we have cathodes and, and the, uh, the fiber itself is an anode. And we've done this in a batch process where we can do several in parallel. And this really only the deposition time, uh, the scale of the time might be only be from a few minutes to maybe about a half hour. Um, for glass fibers, uh, we back it with an electrode. And for glass fibers, it's very interesting how the, the film forms throughout uh, the uh, process. So this is actually uh, the nanotubes integrated into a glass fiber preform. And what's interesting is you see, your, you see this very uniform coating, and these are fibers uh, that are we've cut apart, we're looking inside of the bundle. So the carbon nanotubes fully penetrate the bundle and also fully coat uh, the fibers. And what is an interesting part of the process because as this film starts to grow, we reach a, what we call electrical percolation, where the surface of the fibers then becomes conductive. Uh, so at some point in the process, it shifts from coating the fibers to building up on the surface. So it's a really a interesting process control issue, whereas it will build up on the surface actually at the very end of the process. Uh, so that's when we stop it. But see, you can see that there's a very uniform uh, film on the outside of nanotubes. Uh, it's about two micron thick, uh, but uh, inside everything is very uniformly coated. And now we just stop the process. We know how this film forms, uh, so we stop the process so we don't get excess uh, on the, uh, the surface of the fabric. Uh, this is actually a polyester uh, fiber as well, and we coated it using the same process. And again, it's because it's ambient temperature, and you see it's a very uniform coating over the surface of the fiber. And it's fairly dense as well. So it's fairly high volume fraction. And again, as I mentioned, we're not just depositing it onto the surface of the fibers, uh, but it's actually fully integrating and penetrating the fiber bundles. And these are just with and without nanotubes. Of course, this is for carbon fiber. Um, with the glass fiber, if we look in and we look at the microstructure, uh, we'll actually see some of these spanning clusters uh, in between the fibers. But you always see a very uniform and very thin coating uh, right on the surface of the fiber. And the spanning clusters are part of the mechanism by how the film forms uh, as, it's, as it's growing. But of course, as we 
uh, look at this. Uh, we can functionalize the nanotubes. This is looking in at the fiber matrix interface. Uh, we can functionalize the nanotubes to bond to the polymer matrix as well as to bond to the fibers. So you see uh, this bridging effect between the fiber and the reinforcement as we ground away uh, to separate the interface. And what we can see is we can see quite large improvements in the shear strength. Uh, this is the uh, through using a double notch compression. Uh, this is the volume fraction of nanotubes in the at the interface. Uh, and here we're almost doubling uh, the shear strength. And of course the question is is that if we just deposit PEI uh, electrophoretically, there's very little increase in the shear strength. So it's really this uh, the formation of a very dense uh, high stiffness and high toughness uh, interface. And of course, if actually, if we just soak it in a PEI solution, uh, we see a significant degradation uh, in the shear strength. And if we look at the surface, uh, it's really this uh, removing the fracture from a very brittle interface fracture uh, into that nanocomposite interface or the tougher uh, interface. So when it, if we look at the fracture surface, we see a very, uh, that the fracture is the glass fibers are very clean, but if we look in at the interface, uh, we see a, a much uh, different morphology uh, where we bonded the PEI. So, uh, you know, I think the limitations of CVD, even though it's as interesting and a scalable process, uh, this process that we've developed in the lab for grafting carbon nanotubes uh, is something that is not only directly scalable, but it's applicable to a wide range of fibers. Uh, it's environmentally friendly. We do it at ambient temperatures, water is a solvent, and we can really control that purity and functionality. So that tailoring and the chemistry of the interface uh, gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in that nature. And of course, one of the interesting things is that we're also making the material conductive, uh, even at very low volume fractions. And then of course, another approach, uh, and of course, we spent a lot of time studying nanocomposites where we would disperse carbon nanotubes in a polymer, uh, look at their mechanical and electrical properties. Uh, and of course these, you know, there are a lot of critical issues. You know, there's an issue of dispersion. How do we untangle the material? Uh, we have to disperse it throughout um, adhesion or the interface, uh, what the chemical functionality is. And I always joke with my students is that when I was a PhD student, I was happy to spend a few months and make a couple grams of really good quality material to characterize. And that's essentially what I did. But now we've been looking at processes which are scalable uh, so we can have an undergraduate go into the lab in the morning and in a couple of hours make a few hundred grams of very good high quality dispersed uh, nanocomposites. As I mentioned, uh, we've studied a lot of different model nanocomposite systems, single walled nanotubes, which are essentially a single sheet of carbon that's rolled into a tube or multi walled nanotubes as well as graphene. Um, but if you look again, uh, this key barrier to this dispersion is the agglomeration of the nanotubes, and that's this spaghetti-like uh, or the noodle-like entanglement. And this approach that we've been looking at to get a very high degree of dispersion, and I, in my own PhD work, we used a lot of solvents uh, to control the viscosity. We would disperse the nanotubes in the solvents, and then we eventually have to drive off uh, the solvent. That's what made it such a time-consuming process. Uh, so we started maybe about uh, seven or eight years ago looking at this calendaring approach, a high precision uh, three roll mill approach uh, where we feed the material in and it actually forms a very thin film over the tops of these rollers. Uh, and we can, uh, this fi thin film where these rollers are rotating in different angular velocities uh, in opposite directions. So if we look down into the gap between the rollers, it's this mismatch in the angular velocity that gives us this high shear mixing. And we can control that gap down to below five micron. Even though that's much smaller than a the nanotube itself, uh, it's a very high shearing. And also the material as it passes through these rollers is very uniformly sheared. The entire, you know, just, um, you know, if you're just mixing something, right, the highest shear is right at the impeller, right at, you know, right at the stick. Uh, but here the entire volume of the material has to pass through the gap. Um, and we've studied this, we've did, done a lot of parametric studies uh, to gain some insight over this. This is actually a picture of some material uh, that's actually not nanotubes, but being processed in the three row mill. And you see uh, this very thin film and we're collecting it here. And what we do is we pass it through uh, 
at progressively smaller gap settings. We start with a fairly large gap setting, and unlike a lot of other milling processes where it's compressive impact as well as shear, uh, in the gap it's nearly a pure shearing, so it tends to be very gentle on the nanotubes. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to break the nanotubes up. We want to keep those large aspect ratios, which from a composite point of view is what we're really interested in. Um, so these are a couple of transmission electron micrographs uh, just showing this evolution of the dispersion of the nanotubes as we process it. Um, it's largely qualitative, but I think you can, at the large gap settings, we still have these very large masses of the entangled nanotubes. Uh, but as we progressively pass it through, uh, this is at a smaller gap, gap setting of 20 micron, the, uh, the nanotube agglomerates themselves are smaller, and we see many more nanotubes uh, dispersed in the matrix. Uh, we go down to smaller gap settings, and say a 10 micron, uh, all of the agglomerates are submicron, uh, and we have a very uniform dispersion, but there's still some residual agglomerates. At the finest gap setting, uh, we see a very uniform dispersion uh, with very few agglomerates. And I think from my point of view, now we, what I found that was quite fascinating is the electrical properties of these nanocomposites, particularly as we process them, we're not cutting them, we're not shortening them. You know, I think one of the things you could do is you could chemically etch the nanotubes and you could make them really short and that makes them much easier to disperse. Um, but here uh, we have very, very low electrical percolation thresholds, so we're, we're forming conductive networks in the insulating polymer and these percolation thresholds can be below 0.1 weight percent of the material. Uh, so here, this is just uh, where we process it at two different gap settings. As you saw, the, uh, the partially agglomerated and dispersed and the most highly dispersed. Uh, so here, uh, at just 0.5 weight percent, of course, epoxy being quite a good insulator, just 0.5 weight percent, uh, 10 orders of magnitude in the volume resistivity of the material. Um, and of course, this is actually also very sensitive to agglomeration. The more highly dispersed the material, the lower the, the resistivity, or essentially it, resistivity being the inverse of conductivity. And you can think of that as that you essentially have more wires participating in the percolating network. If they're just in a ball, they're not carrying current. Uh, but if we can uniformly disperse them, uh, we see that more efficient. But even then, even when we have some partial agglomeration, we still see these very low, just 0.1 weight percent of the material. And it's roughly log linear uh, with concentration. Um, so we can process this material using the calendaring approach uh, and the viscosity up to about maybe about one weight percent of carbon nanotubes is still very workable. We can use conventional, this is a vacuum assisted RTM process, uh, so this is just the ambient temperatures and under vacuum uh, using, uh, this is Epon 862, so it's a low viscosity uh, polymer, so you can see this is actually, this is this is probably a part we made about 10 years ago. This was, so this was probably at the time one of just a huge nanotube composite part. Um, but you can see this is the flow front uh, as it's moving in. Um, and we have such a very high de degree of dispersion, we do, really don't see a filtering effect of the nanotubes. We've sectioned and we've done a lot of electrical characterization uh, and uh, looked at, you know, we've looked at the electrical properties in this area as well as near the inlet and there's really no uh, variation. But this, this is the same graph as you saw with the volume resistivity uh, in the composite. Uh, so we have this low percolation threshold. This is 0.25 to 0.75 weight percent in the polymer matrix in a glass fiber composite. Uh, so we are achieving electrical percolation at a very low concentration. Uh, and what these, net, what these nanotubes are essentially doing is they're forming these conductive networks throughout the composite. They're forming them around the fibers uh, as well as in between the layers. And what was interesting also, we published this uh, several few years ago in Applied Physics Letters, is that the material itself is actually anisotropic electrically, and that's partly due to how the, net, the fibers themselves affect the formation of these percolating pathways. And uh, the resistivity is higher in the transverse direction than it is in the longitudinal direction. And the reason for that is that in the transverse direction, the Percolating pathways have to go around the fibers. Uh, so not only is it a longer length, uh, we've done percolation modeling and it's statistically more probable uh, that the nanotubes will form in those, that the, the spanning clusters will form uh, in the region between the polymers. Uh, 
as, w as well as uh, transverse. So it's statistically more probable in the zero degree direction. So there's an anisotropy of about one order of magnitude, even though the fiber itself is non-conductive. But I think what I found really fascinating was is that this material is what we call piezo resistant. Uh, so if we take the material, if we take these nanocomposites uh, that are above the percolation threshold and we load them in tension, uh, the re electrical resistance changes much more than we would expect uh, simply based on axial strain and Poisson, Poisson contraction of the specimen. Uh, so we often talk about that in terms of gauge factors. So if you have a resistive strain gauge, there's not really any piezo resistivity. But uh, in this case, we can have gauge factors. Uh, well over 10 or 100, a typical strain gauge has a gauge factor under 2. Um, so it's very sensitive, but it's also the material itself. And so this is essentially what's going on, the cartoon of what's going on at the nanoscale is that as we strain it, what's happening is not the nanotubes themselves that are changing, but the nanotube network is being strained, and the tunneling gaps are actually what dominate the electrical conductivity. So as we strain it, these nanotubes move away from each other, and all these little tunneling gaps as we strain it, all these ch infinitesimal changes in the resistance at that tunneling gap add up over thousands and thousands uh, of gaps to give you a large change in bulk resistivity or bulk conductivity uh, as you strain it. So uh, again, as you apply more strain, uh, these tunneling gaps change. Uh, but I thought we were, and this really just grew out of some of my fundamental work. We were doing a lot of electrical characterization, and I wrote a program so that I could archive the data and a little graph, and uh, I would start bending and twisting the specimens, and I would see the resistance change a lot. Uh, so this got really got us into the sensing research, uh, and we thought, well, at the point where the material starts to crack, you're going to permanently sever these conducting networks. Uh, so if we go and we look at at a nanocomposite, we go in and we look at the crack. Uh, you can see the nanotubes here are protruding into this crack. And this is a small crack. It's only about a micron across. Um, but you can see that the crack is permanently severing some of these conducting networks. Uh, and I think what's unique about this is, you know, we can, we can do strain sensing, but for damage sensing, in order to sense a microscale crack, you need a nanoscale wire. Uh, so this we thought, well, how can we utilize this? And uh, you know, we're now able to make these composites. We can process them. We can make these glass fiber composites and carbon fiber composites. We can make glass fiber composites electrically conductive. We can make carbon fiber composites more conductive. Um, can we use this to sense cracks? And I think it's just you know this unique the the mechanical and electrical coupling behavior. Uh, for strain sensing is very interesting, but uh, it's really this three order of magnitude difference in the scale where we can get the nanotubes in the fibers and form these electrically conducting networks. Uh, so it's really this change in the reinforcement scale from the conventional micron size reinforcements of carbon and glass uh, down to the three orders of magnitude smaller with carbon nanotubes uh, it enables us to create these conductive, almost nerve like networks surrounding the fiber. And there's a lot of other things. Uh, my research group, we've been looking at this quite extensively. Uh, there's other things, and in, in addition to just straining and cracking, uh, there's chemical changes that occur because of polymer mobility or we, you know, changes in temperature or humidity. Uh, we've actually shown that we can detect glass transition temperature in situ. Uh, so we don't have to do, you know, like a, a DMA or a DSC test or chemical characterization, but rather we can heat the specimen and we can look at uh, the electric changes in the electrical properties, and these changes in the electrical properties are due to the changes in the polymer mobility at the interphase region. And I think on the broader scale, when you think about, you know, these nanotubes severing the networks is really just you have a network of resistors, and you start cutting up some of the resistors, and uh, you'll see some bulk resistance change. So when we first published, <coughs> excuse me, when we first published this work, it actually drew a lot of attention. Uh, there was a University of Delaware article, but then it got picked up, and it was uh, in a lot of, it was in the net composites, of course, our composites, E, junk mail, uh, was in, uh, there did, was an article in Nano Today, but there was also this interesting uh, cover story in this me Eureka magazine, and it's actually a, a very applied engineering magazine in Europe. Um, and I think, again, this kind of goes towards, this is a very practical application of nanotechnology. Um, not only are we imparting this unique sensing functionality to the composite, we're doing it in a very small volume fraction of nanotubes, 
and 0.5 weight percent in the polymer when we infuse it, just 0.15 volume percent in the composite. So we're imparting this unique functionality. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, since the microscale crack, you really need a nanoscale wire. So, of course, this is something I would teach in my class. You know, the, the, basically the, the micro matrix microcracking is a classical problem in mechanics um, where you get set formation and saturation of transverse microcracks due to shear lag. Um, and of course, we all know matrix, matrix cracking is very, it's quite detrimental to the durability. Uh, so these are some micrographs, again, of a cross fly composite with a transverse crack. And if I zoom in a little further, I see the crack at the interface and of course, uh, the crack around the interfaces of the fibers as well as in between the fibers. If I zoom into the next level, I can see the carbon nanotubes protruding in that crack. So we're able to process these materials to create these conductive networks throughout the fiber uh, applies. So this is just our very first experiments uh, that kind of launched, uh, you know, and, and several research programs and a much more extensive. We were interested in looking at uh, sensing of both delamination as well as matrix microcracking. So here uh, is a specimen designed to promote delamination and tension uh, where we cut the center ply. This is a unidirectional composite where we cut the center ply. So the shear stress builds up at the end. Uh, so as we load it in tension, uh, the material starts to delaminate. So as we load it in tension, okay. As we lower the tension, the delamination grows, is first initiates and then grows along the interface of the pi discontinuity. And in this, you know, this shows the blue line showing the load deformation, uh, the red line showing that it would not only be very sensitive to this initiation of the delamination, uh, but also the extension. Uh, the resistance change of the specimen itself well over 300% for failure. Uh, and of course, there's Microcracking and a classical system is just cross ply composite, and of course the matrix cracks saturate to a, a actually a fairly uniform uh, cracking. As we would load it, uh, we would be able to sense this crack formation, uh, but also the accumulation uh, of cracks. And at the very end, uh, there is the lamination. But what was interesting to me is that when we we're doing a lot of these tests. We were looking at looking at how the cracks form, but if I would load it in tension, so this is this piezo-resistive behavior. So this is the linear behavior, and this is where we start getting in the formation of these cracks. So this is just the incipient damage uh, that's occurring in the deposit. But as we unload it, these cracks actually close on themselves because there's there's fairly small uh, amount of cracks, and the resistance initial resistance goes back to its uh, very close to its initial resistance change. But as we load it back up. These cracks reopen in a very small strain. So this nonlinear behavior actually tells us something about the state of damage in the composite. So when we have cracks, this material behavior is very nonlinear. So, so we started doing a lot more comprehensive, looking at how the cracks open and close and the crack accumulation. And this is a progressive increasing cyclic loading where we're loading it up to a higher load level on each cycle. And of course, you see this is initially the first couple of cycles, the strain follows the resistance change almost perfectly, the linear piezo resistive behavior. But as we initiate cracks, uh, we see a significant nonlinearity. Of course, we see jumps when the cracks form. As we unload, we, there's permanent resistance change. But on this reloading and unloading, uh, it's very nonlinear. As we look in, this is where the cracks are reopening. Uh, then we have the elastic loading, which is the linear piezo resistivity, and the followed by additional damage accumulation once we reach to a higher strain level. And this is just really the same data that showed in terms of strain, and we can see this linear piezo resistive behavior, and then we see the incipient damage. Uh, but as we load and unload, uh, we see the damage accumulation and also the cracks closing. So it's interesting in that, you know, one of the things we often do in testing, we do acoustic emission. So we bond an acoustic sensor to the side of the specimen and we listen for cracks. So if a formation of a stress wave. But of course, if your acoustic emission system isn't on or plugged in or your sensor fell off, you don't know that a crack occurred. But here, there's some damage in the specimen and just by reloading it, we could fatigue it and we could reload it and we could get some information about the state of damage. 
uh, just by loading it in its elastic range. Uh, this is this crack reopening, elastic loading, and new damage. So, uh, as you can see, actually, there's a fairly large portion uh, that's due to the resistance change due to the crack reopening. So, what we do is we linearly fit this linear uh, piezo resistive portion and we take it back to zero strain. And that's how we uh, quantify what we would call the, the damaged <clears throat> resistance. So, we had a PhD student, Li Mi, she did some very, very careful. Uh, measurements, tedious measurements, but that's what grad students are for, right? Um, where we would load it and we would take edge replicas and uh, we would look at the cracks. And this is really, you know, of course, these are the classical stages where we have the initiation uh, and the formation of transverse crack. These are actually uh, optical micrographs of edge replicas. So we've taken an impression of the side of the specimen, we take it off and we can image that. Uh, and then also at the very end, the end stage. Uh, we start getting ply delamination once we reach uh, saturation. Uh, so we looked at this damage under the cyclic loading, we measured all this crack accumulation, and I think what's interesting is if we look at the normalized elastic modules, we often talk about residual stiffness or residual strength of the material when there's damage. Uh, of course, you can be almost completely saturated with cracks. So the six, 16 cracks per centimeter is about saturation, and the elastic modules, the Young's modules, changed by less than 5%. Uh, but you can see here, this is the uh, damage, the, what we call the damage resistance that I defined in the previous slide. And this is per unit length of the specimen uh, as a function of the crack density. And in the microcracking range, it's very linear form accumulation of this damage resistance with cracks. So the physical significance of this graph is that that linear region is really ohms per crack. Uh, so it can potentially be a quantitative measure. Uh, and then near delamination where we're getting larger scale damage, uh, we see a much higher increase in the, uh, in the resistance because we're getting much larger scale damage and cutting off. Uh, and of course, we validated this not only with microscopy, but with acoustic emission. We have an acoustic emission sensor as well. Uh, so we can bond that to the specimen. The green lines are just the raw acoustic hits. Uh, and you can certainly see when uh, there is a large number of hits. Uh, that's when we see this jumping in the resistance curve, again, correlating directly. Uh, we've done a lot of fatigue characterization. And this is also very interesting. And then we can, we don't have to monitor it all the time, actually. Uh, but in the initial cycles, this, uh, everything is linear. But as we accumulate damage, uh, we see this nonlinearity in the cracks reopening and closing under fatigue. And this is up to 5 million cycles. Uh, so again, uh, and these are just 10 cycles that we pulled out of the data. Uh, but again, we see these permanent changes in the resistance, uh, but also this nonlinearity, and that tells us something about the state of damage. Uh, here we're approaching delamination, and that becomes the crack reopening becomes less, much less of an important uh, parameter. So we've also modeled this, uh, you know, analytically, where we look at the formation of the conductive networks uh, under stress. Uh, this is a percolating network in a fiber composite. So what you see the blue is nanotubes. And this is meshed with a finite element. So it's a combination of mechanical as well as an electrical uh, characterization. Uh, so here are the stress contours are the first principal strain. And due to this discontinuity and the stiffness between the fiber and the matrix, stress concentration is always right at the fiber. Um, and we see these, the, the initiation is really this debonding of the interface or near the interface, the formation of the cracks. Uh, as we load it higher, uh, we see uh, more local damage progression. Then we see this coalition, coalescence of the damage in terms of a transverse microcrack. Um, and this is a simulation from my colleague uh, Chen Yu Li and uh, Sue Chu. And uh, of course, this is a stress strain curve. They're not accounting for the piezo resistive behavior. So these, you just really see them as jumps uh, without any linearity in between, because uh, that's very difficult to model. But in this case, uh, we see what we would call the characteristic mean when you have damage initiation. Uh, we also see these jumps as you accumulate damage and at a larger scale. So qualitatively, it matches our experimental data very well. Do you see like a lot of the mechanisms you're modeling for that like, in the spacement changing in a higher strain rate than versus the um, that's a good question. I think the, um, I mean, 
obviously the, the the strain rate dependence is largely in the matrix, right? And and what we're doing is we're really modi we're modifying both the matrix properties, but particularly the interface properties. So we're um, we're significantly increasing the shear modulus of that region right around the fiber. And, and it's also much tougher. Of course, you have the synergy of the, the nanotube interfaces as well. Um, and I, I, again, this is just kind of speculation, but I, I would think that especially the interface is, plays a major role, as you know, the high rate, high rate loading of the interface. Uh, so I, I could see that this being a, a significant difference. Um, so picking up again, uh, Gerard has been looking at the uh, uh, influence of anisotropy. Of course, uh, carbon fiber composites are conductive, uh, but they're very insensitive to the formation. When we measure electrical properties, they're very insensitive to the formation of matrix cracks. And part of that reason is, is that they are so anisotropic. Uh, so this is some of Gerard's simulations where we're looking at current flux uh, in different plies under different electro configurations. And this is for the carbon fiber. Uh, you see that there's very little flux in the transverse ply. And that's why it's very un insensitive to damage. So this high anisotropy ratio, essentially the zero to equalize short everything out. Um, but what we can do with composites and nanotubes, uh, we can utilize that to modify the transverse electrical properties. Uh, so as we make the material more isotropic, and keep in mind that this scale of the normalized current density is on a log scale. So we're talking orders of magnitude changes. Uh, so by modifying with carbon nanotubes, essentially making the material more isotropic, uh, we're getting a lot more current flux, and that's why we see much higher sensitive sensitivity to damage uh, by formating the carbon nanotube uh, networks uh, in the composite. Uh, we've also done some multi-physics modeling where we're looking at this uh, damage analysis using a nonlinear damage mechanics uh, to look at uh, uh, this behavior and being able to model it more on a continuum scale rather than at the very idealized unit cell. We just had the previous model, we had to account for the nanotubes and it was really just a like a 10 micron by 10 micron or maybe 40 micron by 40 micron unit cell. Uh, but this is the idea here is that we could make it uh, and use damage mechanics and do it on a more um, uh, a much larger scale. So I'll just conclude uh, with a few key aspects. So this, we have this very powerful laboratory scale technique uh, where we can sense and we can look at the damage accumulation. Uh, we've not only studied, I could, I could spend a couple hours talking about this, but I assume you want to get home tonight, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, we spent a lot of work looking at sensing of damage in joints. Uh, there was a program where we looked at both adhesively bonded as well as mechanically fastened joints. Uh, we've looked and we've done some sensing at high strain rates, um, but I think, you know, and, 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 and using a lot of different things. So different microstructures, 3D woven and braided materials as well. Uh, but I think that we can detect it is interesting, but there's a lot of interest in doing things that are more localized and site specific. If I cut my hand, I want to know when my hand is cut, right? So here, we're, you know, in this specimen, we're really getting a distributed measure of the damage. We're sourcing the, uh, the, uh, the uh, current throughout the entire specimen. Well, here, uh, we're looking at more techniques where we can not only sense that there is damage, but sense that location. Uh, so I'll just briefly highlight some of the work. And each one of these is a, a student uh, working on their thesis or, or PhD, master's or PhD thesis. Um, so his approach using uh, electrical impedance tomography, which is uh, Gerard's, a lot of Gerard's work. Uh, we've been applying this to structural health monitoring where we're not just sensing of damage in composites, but using these and looking at different techniques uh, where we can actually uh, sense damage in concrete and steel structures, particularly things that are very difficult to inspect. Uh, I've worked with a number of civil engineering colleagues uh, and also this approach that we're looking at now and, and how is working on this is using an AC time domain reflectometry uh, to localize where that damage is. So I'll just go through and I'll, I'll cut out most of the theory, but this electrical impedance tomography, instead of sourcing the specimen, uh, we're sourcing and, and measuring around the boundaries of the specimen. So we can source at any given pair of electrodes, uh, and then we can also measure the potential at any electrode. Uh, so, um, you know, this requires essentially it's an inverse problem. 
So we're, you know, we're sourcing and measuring and we're taking that data and we can use numerical techniques and algorithms uh, to back out a conductivity map uh, of the specimen. So we reconstruct the conductivity map. Uh, so we initially have, uh, we take our, of course, our baseline measurements, uh, we use that and we can reconstruct the conductivity. Uh, these are just some examples. Uh, and these are a lot of different specimens. Uh, so this is a uh, isotropic material, uh, it's a non-woven so we, have, we initially want to start with a very simple system. We don't want this problem of anisotropy uh, that we were just talking about. So here's where we have an isotropic nanotube patch uh, where we've distributed this on essentially it's a non-woven veil of material and we cut out material, cut out areas. So this is the initial space. This is where we've drilled a hole and cut out a rectangular or square patch uh, and done these uh, conductivity maps. Uh, and you can see the conductivity reconstruction is quite accurate. Uh, not only in location, uh, noting the location of the material, uh, but to an extent also the shape. Um, and again, of course, the removing the area basically is a, results in a negative conductivity change. Um, again, this is, this is uh, looking at more of a sensitivity, sensitivity to the formation of a crack in the material. Uh, we've just taken and cut away uh, some of the conducting areas. Uh, so this is an e-glass car, uh, sorry, this is a CNT. Uh, size where we put the nanotubes on this isotropic um, and then we've extended and we've cut a cut in the patch uh, and the reconstruction uh, the reconstruction of the kind of community map and the location is fairly accurate um, but the size uh, is expanded from what it is but of course we're, we're looking and we can detect the location and, and there are other techniques uh, different algorithms and different measurements uh, where we might be able to uh, zoom in a little bit more on the crack. Uh, but again, and there's also this issue of anisotropy. Uh, the current spreading also uh, plays a role in uh, detecting and localizing where the damage is. Again, that's something as uh, ongoing work. Uh, this is sensing, and this is a fairly large fight. This is sensing of localized damage under impact, uh, something that, you know, could, if we had an airplane wing. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a fairly large specimen that's mounted in our impact tower. So we're doing a low velocity drop weight impact. Of course, this is the initial state, uh, but as we um, impact at higher and higher energies, there's five and 10 and 20 joules, uh, you see this conductivity reconstruction and you can see this localized uh, and more site specific damage. This is fairly large, this is where you're getting uh, the dimple in the uh, in the surface. So, uh, and of course, there's a lot of ongoing work in this area. So there's some key challenges, is you know, particularly reducing the measurement noise. Uh, that's something we've been looking at a lot, and uh, scaling to more accurately uh, detect the uh, damage state. As I mentioned, this is not just a laboratory technique. This is my colleague Tom Schumacher. Uh, we've had a couple programs from NSF as well as. Delaware Department of Transportation, a fairly large program from the Federal Highway Administration where we're looking at applying these to large structures. Uh, the nice thing about the way we're doing this, and we can do it with electrophoresis and a lot of these other approaches, is very conformable to a surface. Uh, so we can create sensors which are uh, can fit onto an existing structure, and it could also be a structural sensor. Uh, this is something we're looking at in terms of structural health monitoring, and this is on a concrete uh, structure and this is a pre-stressed concrete and you see the formation of these cracks. A lot of the things they do in looking at these pre-stressed concrete structures are bond strain gauges. And of course, strain, gauge, strain gauges are really just quasi-point sensors. So unless there's a crack right near that strain gauge, it's very difficult to see any change um, in the structure. You might see a momentary change, uh, but that strain generally remains constant. Well here, our patches could potentially um, uh, strengthen the material, but also as a crack propagates through, uh, we can detect and we can utilize some of these techniques. Uh, we published this uh, paper about, well, towards the end of, it actually came out in early 2014, uh, so it was about a year ago, um, uh, where we can utilize this as more of a uh, large scale sensor. We collaborated with a company uh, in the San Francisco area, Acelent Technologies. They're a structural health monitoring company and they're, what they do is they make these smart layers that have acoustic sensors on them. And these acoustic sensors vibrate and listen. And But the whole thing is with acoustic sensors you have to have fairly large scale damage. There has to be multi centimeters of a delamination uh, because this damage doesn't really change the Young's modulus. So of course that's what you're sensing. Um, 
also is interesting is, is that there, you know, of course, if you if you have something, if you're just touching the surface, that changes how the uh, how the land waves move as well. But what we did is we collaborated with this company uh, where they would have both their PZC sensors, but they would elect integrate these electrodes. Uh, and what it was a very elegant way to make the electrodes for electrical impedance tomography. Uh, so this is their so-called smart layers. Uh, this is a small scale one. This is a two inch by ten inch tensile bar uh, that we put it on. At the time, it was one of the larger composites we made, uh, and you can see there's our acoustic sensors as well as electric sensors, uh, and we have this working in co combination uh, with our uh, carbon nanotube based uh, sensing uh, device. In phase two, we more integrated the systems uh, and looking at this damage. Uh, so in this case, this is again some impact testing where we just have four electrodes, but we're able to uh, localize that normalized electrical response. You see that in the C-scan image. Uh, this is just sort of an interesting one, and hopefully this works. Uh, so this is where we pattern the carbon nanotubes, uh, and this is a composite where, where we have these uh, orthogonal layers of the uh, carbon nanotube sensor. And as you can see, that's my finger pushing on the panel. And in the background, you see the curvature of the panel uh, as it's bent. And then I'm going to reach and I'm going to bend the back corner. And also in the background, if you can see it, uh, you see that bending up of the corner. So we can create these distributed sensors in the composite. Uh, this is a nice show and tell thing. We take it to like, you know, um, Outreach, you know, outreach things, we've taken it to museums, and people love to like grab it, shake it, and twist it. Um, and this is really something that's done in real time. Uh, another, and the final thing I'll talk about is this sort of uh, using a advanced high frequency electrical magnet, electromagnetic, uh, looking at the formation of damage. Of course, we can change the AC and DC electrical properties with very small amounts of nanotubes or nanomaterials. And there's time domain reflectometry. In short, we have a high frequency electromagnetic pulse. It's in the microwave frequency range and about the two gigahertz range. And we send that down some sort of a waveguide. And that waveguide can be two parallel wires. It can be anything. It can be strips. Uh, so we send this pulse. And when it hits the discontinuity, it sends a reflection back to the detector. So when these, when the, and this discontinuity is a change in the dielectric properties as you send this pulse down during a reflection back to the detector. So if we know the frequency of the pulse, we can transform the time domain into the spatial do domain. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with this because uh, when you have multiple discontinuities, there's internal reflection. So being able to solve that inverse problem to give us full picture uh, is a challenge, but something we've been uh, looking at. Uh, so this is damage sensing with TDR. Essentially what happens in the region of the specimen so this is basically our raw data that we get. And this is a very fast process. This is nanoseconds. So you know this is basically nanosecond, picosecond rise times. And the total duration uh, over the length of the specimen is just one and a half nanoseconds. So we're, this is something, it actually takes us a lot longer to process the data than you know, nanoseconds to process data, five seconds to get all the data in the waveform. Uh, but essentially this is a specimen and you can see, uh, this is one of the earlier ones, uh, but you see this change and this corresponds to a change in impedance of the system. Uh, ideally if there was a, a very uniform impedance change, you just see it jump right at this. Uh, so this is a specimen, but out here, we, this is what we call the open circuit reflection. And this has data in it as well that is from the specimen because there's internal cracks and that moves data outside uh, so that's the internal reflection portion, uh, but I think we did we replicated a lot of the experiments that we did previously with and without nanotubes, and the blue line being without nanotubes, and we're really not detecting anything. There is some strain sensitivity actually of the composite because of the changing dielectric, but we really don't see any permanent change in the baseline impedance uh, until we have fairly large scale damage in terms of delim delamination. Uh, the sand where we've added carbon nanotubes. Uh, we're actually able to detect that microcracking. Uh, so this is the effective impedance as a, number, a function of our load cycles. The red line uh, showing uh, the red line showing that there's very little change in the microcracking uh, without nanotubes, but we can sense the lamination. Well, when we 
modify it with nanotubes, we can sense after the second cycle we're initiating damage, uh, we can sense that formation of cracks. So it also makes it sensitive to the AC. Um, and again, uh, this is some of our acoustic emission uh, where we're looking at, we, we're detecting uh, pretty much where we see the delamination is this dotted line. Uh, so really this was for the first time we extended the uh, TDR technique to sense microscale cracks. Um, this is some work from Howe uh, where he's done impact. These are actually uh, carbon nanotube, pattern carbon nanotube uh, lines. So this is the uh, impedance. This is an iPad just for scale. So it's a reasonably decent sized panel. Uh, so we've impacted it. The impact damage is barely, barely visible. Uh, but again, in the uh, raw data, um, you know, so again, this is the specimen, the area of the specimen. And we see when we, this, and this is fairly small damage. Uh, fairly low velocity, but you can see that location uh, where the damage forms very clearly. And there's some broadening, partly because there's internal reflection in this region of damage as well. Uh, so uh, that's one of the problems. So with that, I'll just conclude really quickly. Uh, you know, I think one of the key aspects is very sensitive to the onset of matrix damage. And that's something uh, that's always a challenge to uh, detect. Um, uh, using conventional techniques, this is large resistance changes at low strain. Uh, it really tells us something about the extent of damage. And we can utilize this potentially real time as a quantitative measure uh, and looking at some enhanced methodologies for uh, life prediction. Uh, so with that, I would just uh, like to acknowledge, of course, my graduate students who do all the work when I sit in the office writing proposals and papers, uh, and of course, how and AK was an undergraduate researcher for a few summers, and, and Howe and Gerard are, are current grad students. Uh, Gerard just defended. Uh, I've worked with a, quite a few number of uh, colleagues. Uh, Andrew Ryder, uh, who is a colleague in Australia, uh, we've worked very closely on the electrophoresis approach. Uh, Tom Schumacher uh, in civil engineering, really scaling this up uh, to, to real you know, structures, and not only in the laboratory, uh, but we're doing some field testing as well. Uh, Acelent Technologies, we've had an Air Force STTR with, and the company Rushford conducted nanofiber, which is co commercializing some of the electrophoresis. And of course, most important funding, uh, the NSF funds so a lot of the infrastructure work as well as the electrophoresis work. Uh, it's my career award. We've had, we're unfortunate to have funding from the Air Force, Army, as well as uh, ONR, uh, the Office of Naval Research. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, we're kind of now moving into this area of applications uh, has gotten some, drawn quite a bit of interest from the Federal Highway Administration uh, as well as Dell DOT. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Can you comment? You discussed the uh, improvement of electrical properties, significant the nanotubes. Can you comment on how uh, thermal properties can be? The, the influence on the thermal properties is less. I mean, we've, we've done quite a bit of thermal conductivity measurements, not so much on the fiber composites, but more on the nano composites. And uh, of course, a, a polymer matrix is highly insulating anyway. So when we talk about, in, instead of being orders of magnitude changes, uh, it might change two or three times or five times as we add carbon nanotubes. Of course, you know, the, the thermal conductivity, you know, is so low that you know a million times zero is still zero, right? So uh, the the thermal conductivity changes are relatively small, but they are they are there. But the whole is more to the mechanism of uh, you know the phonon scattering as opposed to electrons jumping from nanotube to nanotube, and a lot of that I think has to do uh, with the non-ideal interface. You know, so it's essentially like a, a thermal resistance. I have two questions. First is how do you achieve reproducibility for your uh, contact, your electrodes? Oh, the electrical contact resistance. That's I, so one of the things we do is we spend a fair amount of time um, plasma etching. So where we, we apply the electrodes, typically they're the resin rich surface. Uh, so we'll remove that, and sometimes it's just by sanding or sandblasting. Uh, but then we can etch away the, po the polymer matrix a little bit uh, using a, a radio frequency plasma, and that etches the nanotube. Or sorry, etches the matrix much more quickly than the nanotubes and exposes it. Um, and then we apply uh, the electrode. Um, typically, there's a lot of different ways to apply the electrode, but we typically use a, 
uh, a silver paint, which is commonly used for electron microscopy, which is a very small, very uh, a coital dispersion of silver nanoparticles, uh, which are which are extremely small. That gives us very good uh, contact resistance. Of course, you can uh, in in some cases you can remove that contact resistance by doing a four wire measurement. And we do a lot of both two and four wire measurements. And when the specimens are highly have high resistivities, the two wire measurement um, it gives exactly the same results uh, because the contact resistance is minimal compared to the resistance of the specimen. So, but there is some, of course, there's specimen to specimen repeatability. There's specimen to specimen, slight specimen to specimen variation uh, in terms of conductivity as well. And sometimes that's uh, related to the degree of dispersion during manufacturing. The kind of question is as you modify the surface of fiber CD nanotubes, now you created this smaller garden moret, which is different. Wouldn't that also ask to have a different resin to properly infuse between all this mi microstructure? I mean, when, when we do say the deposition or the electrophoresis or growing the nanotubes on the surface of the fiber, um, when we go in and we look at the, the nanotubes are always extremely well wet out. And part of the reason for that is, is the functionality that we apply. Um, and there's a wide variety of different functionalities, uh, but particularly the polyethylene meaning is very compatible with the epoxy. Um, I will say that it, one thing that it does do is that it in, um, drastically changes the um, the permeability of the, the fabric layer. Uh, so it becomes less permeable to resin flowing through it. And, and one of the things we initially did is of course, when we do like double notch compression, really we just need nanotubes at the, the failure surface, right? So we put the nanotubes in the middle and then built up the thickness with uh, just regular layers of glass or carbon. And uh, as we infused it, one thing we did note is that, you know, essentially the red flow front would flow over the top and it, the time scale was much longer uh, to infuse. So that certainly is a, is a processing, there's a, there's going to be a balance in terms of, uh, uh, you know, it takes longer for us to infuse the carbon nanotube modified uh, fibers, but they're always very nicely well wet out. Essentially, you are sort of resorting or going back to what happened in the surface field from the metals, FDA, BAA, whatever, when you cut off from the surface, the microstructure essentially cast the resin sure. into that surface, and that, that's what holds another chemistry. Yeah, I mean, and you need to have the right material that wants to infuse into the, the spaces. Sure, exactly. I mean, I think in this case, the multi wall tubes are fairly large. And there's a PEI, the polyethylene amine. The po concentration of polyethylene amine is actually fairly high. It's about 20% uh, by weight uh, when we deposit it. And the, when the nanotubes deposit, and I don't know if I have a good micrograph of that. And those cell structures really, are they, you know, one micron, 50 microns, 100 microns? I mean, not a meter. How big are those volumes that you're casting in? Not just fiber size, but the speed, free space that there is in this. Going into how big are the metrics? How bigger? Oh, in the nanotube. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the nanometer range. I mean, maybe not nanometers, but at least in the tens of nanometer range, because essentially you have the nanotubes that have a coating of PEI on them, and these nanotubes, and particularly when, um, and I actually don't think I have this. When the nanotubes are very short it's much more difficult to infuse them because what happens is that the nanotubes actually lay down on the surface. So it almost looks like there's some partial alignment. Um, but in this case, the nanotubes, the multi wall nanotubes that we have actually are quite, have a, a curled morphology, exactly. So when you look at it, um, let's see if I can get through this. When you look at it very closely, uh, it looks more like a sponge as, as, as opposed to, at the beginning we did a lot of, um, uh, acid etching, and the acid etching is quite damaged to the, uh, not only is it fairly low yield because you, en you end up etching away about 50% of your nanotubes, but uh, that makes them actually fairly low aspect ratio. And um, uh, but those three spaces said is uh, it's 10, 50 nanos. Yeah, I mean, I guess the one thing is that I never see voids or we never see significant voids in the areas that have um, the nanotubes and the concentration right at the surface. And as we look at, I'm almost there. Yeah. So if we look at these, and I and I don't have any higher magnification, but when you zoom in on these, 
they're always very they're very nicely infused. And again, if we zoom in on the surface of the fiber, this scale is very small. This is maybe 100 nanometer coating. Uh, so it's not a particularly thick coating. Uh, and then there are these spanning clusters in between, and that's partly, that's partly related to how we dry the specimen, but it's also partly related to how the film forms as it's depositing. So it's not just a physical deposition, uh, but actually one of the, and I, I cut this out of the presentation because it was getting a little long, but what actually happens is that the nanotubes don't just rain down onto the surface. Uh, what happens is that there's electrolysis occurs in the water, and the half reaction the ions actually deprotonate the PEI. So the polyethylene amine has this positive charge. So what happens, there's a very high pH gradient that forms right at the surface, and that causes the, the nanotubes to deprotonate. So they actually precipitate out right in that region, right by the fiber surface. So that's why you have such uniform coating as well. And changing the pH is, I mean, we've done work We've done quite a bit of chemical characterization. In fact, uh, we just pub paper should come out very soon. Is we've done a lot of chemical characterization using uh, bottle interfaces and uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and looked at that. Um, you know, looked at the basically the change in the shear strength, uh, and and there's definitely chemical bonds that are forming between the nanotubes and the PEI, but also the PEI and the resin in the PEI and and the whatever the fiber surface is as well. But certainly I could see that if, you know, these very dense arrays, some people do where they grow nanotube arrays, and, and certainly the time scale for wetting those is much longer because you have this surf, large surface area. Okay, so I guess there are no more questions with that. I'd like to especially thank you guys for coming and, and the leadership of Sampi, uh, Valentin, and uh, so for, for helping or for inviting me to talk tonight. So.